dedicate today's lecture to the memory of our late Chief Justice Ahmadi, who passed away today. He was a great judge and I remember him very fondly because he was extremely good to young people and I was one of the young people who he was extremely good to. May his soul rest in peace. Today's subject is one which concerns democracy at its absolute core level. Many people have always assumed that freedom of speech somehow goes back to Magna Carta. Magna Carta is of the year 1215 AD. And they assume that because of clauses 39 and 40 of Magna Carta, from which at least justice and liberty in the Anglo-Saxon world springs. But as a matter of fact, freedom of speech comes down in the Anglo-Saxon world to a much, much later era. Magna Carta was essentially at that time a struggle between King John and his nobles. Parliament was not the institution we know it to be. And it took many centuries before Parliament itself developed its to, into the institution that we know it to be. So the stage really for freedom of speech was set in 1689 for the first time, when the Bill of Rights was enshrined in the reign of the first Dutch king that England ever had, William III, and his cousin consort Mary II. This was on James II, one of the most uh, dictatorial monarchs being expelled from England without a shot being fired. And in this Bill of Rights of 1689, freedom of speech was not spoken of as belonging to the citizen. It was spoken of as belonging only to parliamentarians. So that freedom of speech was guaranteed in parliament, which was a very important thing at that time. Because Charles I, a couple of years, 50 years earlier, had picked up persons from parliament and dissolved it. So that freedom of speech has its first beginnings only in parliament. It took another century for the citizen to be given this right or for this right to be recognized as against the state. And it happened in the French Revolution, which as you all know took place in 1789, exactly 100 years after this Bill of Rights. And somehow or the other, the 1789 Declaration of the Rights of Man in France specifically spoke of freedom of speech and said that it could only be curbed in the interest of public order, something very, very interesting when we come to our constitution. And of course, other abuses which will be laid down by law. Two years later, the US constitution, which had already been promulgated in the same year, 1789, had a bill of rights attached to it by its first amendment. And the very first clause of that first amendment spoke of the freedom of speech in absolute terms. And this time it was in absolute terms against Congress, that is against the central legislature in the United States. So it said, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech and press. It took many centuries for us to throw off the British yoke. And when we did, in our constitution in 1950, we declared ourselves first to be a sovereign democratic republic in our preamble. And we made it clear that what was important in a democracy and a republic as opposed to British rule was the fact that now there would be universal adult franchise and we would be headed by a president who is elected and not a monarch. The important thing to note is 
that this is done through the medium of liberty of thought and expression, specifically mentioned also in the preamble. So armed with liberty of thought and expression, our founding fathers laid down in Article 19.1a in the Fundamental Rights Chapter or Chapter 3 of our Constitution, the fact that every Indian citizen shall have the freedom of speech and expression. At that time, speech and expression could be curbed only under Article 19.2. As it originally stood, it was a very peculiar article. Because the very next right that is spoken of is the freedom to assemble peaceably, which is Article 19.1b. And that was controlled by the succeeding clause to 19.2, which is 19.3. And 19.3 said that when it comes to freedom of assembly, the legislature may make laws which are reasonable restrictions in the interest of public order. The same expression used in the Declaration of Man of 1789. Each one of these three expressions was missing from Article 19.2 in the beginning. So Article 19.2 said a law could be made curbing speech provided it fell under four categories. The first would be security of state. The second would be def defamation. The third would be decency or morality. And the fourth would be contempt of court. Now in 1950 itself, two judgments of seminal importance were laid down by our Supreme Court, consisting of six judges each. Because at that time, in 1950, though the sanction strength was eight, the court started off with six, so it was the full bench really that heard both these cases. The first was the case of Ramesh Thapa versus the state of Madras. Patanjali Shastri J, speaking for the court, was confronted with a particular Madras Act which banned circulation or allowed the banning of circulation of newspapers, weeklies, etc. in the state of Madras. And Ramesh Thapa was the owner, editor, etc. of Crossroads which was published in Bombay and printed all over including the state of Madras. And by a notification made by the state of Madras under that Madras Act, there was a complete ban imposed on the circulation of this particular weekly in the state of Madras. The Supreme Court had no difficulty striking down this section, to section 9 a of that Madras Act. And its reasoning essentially was that unlike 19.3, which I just spoke about, there was no public order exception to freedom of speech. The only exception was security of state. And security of state is at a much higher pedestal. Public order would, for example, be a riot of a local nature. Security of state would go to the security of India itself. And as avowedly this 1949 Madras Act was made so as to curb public disorder, they said public order is not an exception to Article 19.1a. So the section is struck down. However, they didn't stop there. They made some very, very important observations on freedom of speech, which are of extreme relevance today. First, they said, circulation of ideas is at the heart of freedom of speech. Second, they went on to say, that it is very important to link freedom of speech with democracy. Because unless political discussion is free, there is democracy only in name and not in reality. And the third thing they did was, they noticed an interesting judgment of the US Supreme Court in Near versus Minnesota, a 1931 judgment, which dealt with what the US Supreme Court called prior restraints on free speech. And the Supreme Court said that the prior restraint on free speech 
can happen only in very narrow and stringent limits and in exceptional circumstances such as war for example or where there is incitement to violence things of that nature and one beautiful observation of chief justice used in that judgment was that it is better to let the noxious branches of the tree of freedom of speech to their luxuriant growth rather than to prune them because in pruning them one may well also prune the branches with which give fruit now with all these observations the very first supreme court put freedom of speech on a pedestal in the companion judgment in bridgebushan versus state of punjab there was an east punjab act which this time required any newspaper or article to first be censored by government before it could be circulated this was again struck down on the same ground as the ground in ramesh thapar because the east punjab act also was a public safety or public order act and since public order was no exception to freedom of speech it was struck down on this ground itself and the observations in the first judgment were reiterated only one learned judge justice fazal ali dissented immediately upon these two judgments being declared came our first amendment and our first amendment was piloted by jawaharlal nehru even before he was elected because if you remember the first election took place in 1952 and the then constituent assembly continued as a provisional parliament so the provisional parliament tabled this first amendment the very first thing that this amendment did in so far as article 192 was concerned was to bring it in line with article 193 so that now you had reasonable restrictions first so there was a balancing act that you required to do and it said in the interest of this is again an important expression because the earlier expression was in relation to much wider so there must be some close nexus between therefore the governmental activity curbing free speech and the subject matters laid down and it added three more subject matters to the four subject matters already there very first obviously being public order which was missing the other being friendly relations with foreign states and the third being a very important again pointer to what can and cannot pass muster incitement to an offence a little more about the word incitement because when we speak of discussion and advocacy they are very different from incitement you must actually incite somebody to do something before you can curb free speech it's only in 1963 finally that one more category was added namely the sovereignty and integrity of india so 192 therefore was brought on line largely following what was stated by the majority judgments in ramesh thapar and bridge bhushan one other very interesting thing happened the first amendment had a kind of constitutional black hole namely it had article 31 b added capital b and article 31 capital b in essence stated that the moment there is any act either of the central legislature or of the state legislatures put into the black hole which is the ninth schedule to the constitution of india then notwithstanding that the section may have been struck down and notwithstanding that it may have violated any fundamental right it comes back to life interestingly enough land reform legislation formed the first 10 entries of this black hole but neither the madras nor the east punjab act were put into it matter of great importance so the legislature was cognizant of the fact that though public order was missing there were other observations made on free speech which gave it this preferred status and that therefore these two acts did not deserve any protection that the land reform acts got 
So immediately a distinction was made between free speech or liberty and property. Now, armed with this, as a matter of fact, Virendra versus State of Punjab is a 1958 judgment. And a 90 Punjab Act, which contained a section 3, which was almost exactly in parameter with the Madras Act in Roma Thapa, was also struck down, and this time under the new 192. So that despite the fact that public order was there as an exception, they found that a blanket ban of circulation, because even in that case, the daily Pratap and the Veer Arjun, which were published in the Punjab, were uh, banned from entering Delhi. Same kind of thing that was done in Romesh Thapa. They said that blanket ban is anathema to free speech and must go. Also, when it came to pre-censorship, the later judgments, one in K.A. Abbas's case in 1971, detailed judgment, Justice Hidayatullah, and a later judgment of, in Anand Patwardhan's case, also went the whole hog in saying that censorship is also to be in very narrow and stringent limits. And in Anand Patwardhan in particular, which was a case where a director, Anand Patwardhan, wanted a particular movie broadcast over Durdashan, which was the only means in those days of getting through to the public on television. And the Durdashan repeatedly refused to broadcast it. The movie essentially was on how women are treated and in particular how degrading and horrible Sati is. Because Roop Kaur at that time had been pushed into a funeral pyre. So the film depicted all this. And finally, the Supreme Court said that if you want to censor something, you must first apply what is called the average person's contemporary community standards test. The average person will be a person who is of robust intellect, not some weakling. Second, you will view the film as a whole. You won't take one small part of it and say this offense or that offense. See it as a whole. Then you will see as to whether there is anything patently offensive in terms of obscenity. And if there is, however, literary or artistic merit in this, then even then it must be allowed. And one other very important observation made in that judgment was that the freedom to, of speech is freedom both ways. One, to communicate ideas, one, to receive ideas. And the receipt of ideas can be from any corner of the world. Very important. Because when we come to what is happening today, there's going to be a comment on this. Now, after these judgments laid down, pretty much that bans are anathema, censorship is anathema. What exactly do we say is the content of this right? Because it's a right which must have some content. As I said earlier, the very first thing in the right is the right to communicate freely ideas of any kind. It doesn't have to be political only. It can be ideas of the widest kind. The second and equally important right is this right to receive those ideas. And the third is that there can be no coercion by the state for a person to speak. That's equally important. So the negative concept of not being co coerced into saying something you don't want to say. Now, as examples of each of these things, we first go to some of the flag cases in the United States. In Stromberg versus California, which is a 1931 judgment, by a 72 majority, because there they sit our bank as nine judges always. There was a red flag, which was the communist flag, which was being paraded around in the streets of a particular city and people shouting slogans. And the question was as to whether this is permissible within the free speech contained in their constitution. And the court had no problems in saying, of course it is, because what is most important is to remember that our constitution, that is the US constitution, believes in 
orderly, peaceful change in government. And this can never happen unless there is a political discussion of all hues in the, in the so-called marketplace of ideas so that people may choose the next government. The other fact case is a remarkable case, Texas versus Johnson, which is a 1989 judgment. Here, by a razor-thin majority of five to four, the two ends of the Supreme Court as judges, Justice Scalia and Justice Brennan, met together to form the majority. This is the only time. <laughs> Otherwise, Justice Brennan was the great liberal and Justice Scalia was the originalist. And they were confronted with something fantastic, which is that a person actually burned the US flag outside the courthouse of Denver as a protest against the Reagan administration and as a protest against Reagan standing for the second time. Now, ordinarily, one would have said burning a national emblem like this is something that is anathema. You just cannot do it. No question of freedom of expression here. But strangely enough, five people said, yes, you can. Because what you are really seeking to do is not to offend people. We also added very hastily that as a matter of fact, there was no violence on the burning of that flag. But they said what you are trying to do is not merely to burn the flag and denigrate the United States. What you are trying to do in burning that flag, and you made it clear by your speech, was to say that America is not a country worth living in if President Reagan comes in again. I have grave doubts that our courts will go to this extent, but it only shows you to what extent the US, a democracy which is now 220 years old and mature, can go to, again by a razor thin majority. Now, apart from these judgments, when we come to the right not to be coerced into speech, you come to what is called the Jehovah Witness cases. Now, the Jehovah's Witness as you know, is a small religious minority group, Protestant group. And they have this belief, it's an ingrained and genuine belief, that organized religion is a grave crime and something which should be done away with immediately as the work of the devil. They also believe that, as the Bible said, you cannot bow to any craven image. So, one of the things that was tested was in the famous Gobaitis case in 1940, where children from this Jehovah's Witness sect in schools refused, basically, to uh, bow to the national flag. And an eight to one majority held that, no, sorry, this is going too far. The flag, after all, is the emblem of America. If it's the emblem of America, everybody must get up and salute it. And you people not getting up and not saluting it is not something that can be tolerated in the name of nationalism. Justice Stone was the sole dissenter. Surprisingly, within three years, another Jehovah's Witness came, uh, case came with exactly the same facts, and this time by a 6 to 3 majority, they reversed that judge in the West Virginia board case versus Barnett. And Justice Jackson, this time speaking for the majority, said two very, very important things where free speech is concerned, and it's been oft quoted in many of our judgments. The first thing that he said was that freedom of speech does not depend on votes or elections. It has been put away from majorities, put away from officials. Most important to remember. And the second thing he said is that if there is one fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is this, that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what is orthodox in matters of politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, quote unquote. A very strong judgment by a very brilliant judge. 
You'll remember Justice Jackson was perhaps the only sitting Supreme Court Justice who ever left his robes behind in America and became public prosecutor at the Nuremberg trials. And the entire New Nuremberg trial, as a matter of fact, revolved around his person. And he came back and took his seat again in the United States Sup Supreme Court, but unfortunately lost the Chief Justiceship because of certain other circumstances. So in these ringing words, we have these two Jehovah Witness cases. And we have our own Jehovah Witness case as well. In this country, in Bijo Emanuel's case in 1986, again this same little religious minority came forward and said that we will not sing the national anthem. We will get up respectfully, but we cannot sing it because of our religious beliefs. Again, our Supreme Court came to their rescue following all these American judgments. And in beautiful language, Justice Chinappa Reddy said, our tradition teaches tolerance. Our philosophy preaches tolerance. Our constitution practices tolerance. Let us not dilute it. Beautiful words. And with that, he allowed these children to get up respectfully and not sing along with the other children. We now come to another interesting aspect of freedom of speech, which is freedom of press. In two or three judgments, our courts have again leaned very heavily in favor of the press. First important judgment is a judgment in Sakal papers, which is a 1962 judgment of our Supreme Court. And there the question was as to a particular central government policy which restricted the price that could be charged by a newspaper per page of its newspaper. And it was said that it was done in order to prevent monopolies. So the idea was that we want the bigger newspapers to be cut down to size so that the smaller newspapers would rise. The Supreme Court would have none of it. Supreme Court specifically observed that this is a direct interference with circulation because the moment you bring your price down, you would necessarily have to bring the number of pages down. And if you bring the number of pages down, then you are directly interfering with freedom of speech and expression. And they therefore struck this down. The other important observation they made was that unlike other fundamental rights, which are subject to laws which are made in the interest of the general public, 192 has no interest of the general public. It has these eight heads under which you either fall or you do not fall. And since you do not fall under any of these heads, namely the creation of a monopoly, would not fall under any of these heads, freedom of speech is unrestricted. Similarly, several years later in Bennett Coleman's case, where my father as additional solicitor general, a very young additional solicitor general, appear against the great Nani Palkhewala and tried to defend a measure similar to that in Sakal. He at least managed to get one judge on his side, Justice Matthew. So it was a four to one judgment. And essentially, that judgment dealt with a newsprint import control policy. And there the import control policy was not on price, but on the number of pages, the newsprint that you could use per newspaper, so I said not more than 10 pages. This was struck down on similar grounds as the Sakal Papers case, saying that circulation is everything when it comes to freedom of expression. And if you are curbing circulation, you are going at the heart of free speech because the newspaper ultimately is the watchdog of democracy in that it prints things that people, that masses of people read and masses of people get influenced by. In the United States, in another very important judgment, which has been repeatedly followed here, New York Times versus Sullivan, 1964 judgment, 
by the arch liberal justice brennan the question was whether newspapers could be held to damages for defamation when somebody said that look you have said so and so about me and it's not strictly correct the american supreme court bent over backwards to protect the newspapers and said that unless there is actual malice and by actual malice what they meant was that unless you know that you are printing something utterly false or you have such reckless disregard for the truth that we will assume that you know that you are printing something false the newspaper is protected and this again we follow in our country so you see how case law has developed freedom of speech and expression and how ultimately it is so so important that there be this huge circulation of ideas among all of us diverse ideas the whole object is that the idea be diverse when we come to 192 and the curbs on freedom of speech as i told you you had those eight subject matters but the first thing that you had to do was you had to pass a law executive action won't do to curb speech second thing that you have to do is you have to see that the law is absolutely necessary to curb speech if there's some other less obtrusive method that has to be followed and of course it must have some direct proximate connection with one of the eight subject matters if it falls outside the eight subject matters again out to go now public order is the most fertile ground for the government justifying curbs on free speech if you remember it was added by the first amendment and public order has been differentiated from law and order and security of state justice hidayatullah very picturesquely in ram manohar lohia's case in 1966 said imagine three concentric circles one law and order two public order and three finally security of state each one getting smaller and smaller and it is only when it is security of state and law and order that you may curb free speech not when it's a mere law and order problem so he made this distinction between two drunks having a quarrel for example and being violent with one another pure law and order problem you cannot interfere with what they say on the other hand you have a public order problem of two let's say religious groups fighting each other and a riot being caused then only may you interfere and not otherwise and this brings me to a very interesting and important test laid down by the us supreme court again followed by us which is that unless there is a clear and present danger they put it beautifully of some violence or some untoward act taking place as a result of the speech you cannot curb free speech and this was very felicitously put by justice holmes who was the author of several judgments in the world war 1 period in the united states and in abrams he was a dissenter and this is how he put this clear and present danger test in language which is inimitable if i may just read it to you persecution for the expression of opinions seems to be perfectly logical if you have no doubt of your premises or your power and want a certain result with all your heart you naturally express your wishes in law and sweep away all opposition to allow opposition by speech seems to indicate that you think the speech important as when a man says that he has squared the circle or that you do not care wholeheartedly for the result or that you doubt either your power or your premises but when men have realized that time has upset many fighting faiths they may come to believe even more than they believe the very foundations of their own con- conduct that the ultimate good desired is better reached by free trade in ideas that the best test of truth is the power of the thought 
to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. And the truth is the only ground upon which their wishes safely can be carried out. That, at any rate, is the theory of our constitution. It is an experiment as all life is an experiment. Every year, if not every day, we have to wager our salvation upon some prophecy based upon imperfect knowledge. While that experiment is part of our system, I think that we should be eternally vigilant against attempts to check the expressions of opinions that we loathe and believe to be fraught with death unless they so eminently threaten immediate interference with the lawful and pressing purposes of the law that an immediate check is required to save the country. Beautiful words. This takes me to an important judgment of our court, Shreya Signal, where I happen to be the author in 2015. And we followed this clear and present danger test as refined later in the later American judgments. Now to mean some imminent call to some lawless action. It must be an imminent call, an immediate call. So you exhort somebody to some violence or something of that, sort, that nature. In Shreya Singhal, what was challenged was on the social media platform, which becomes very important given the media that we have today. So when you have a social media platform, you had a section 66 capital A of the Information Technology Act, which provided that anything on the internet that was passed by any citizen, if that happened to be grossly offensive or annoying, this is the language used in the section, then such person could be bunged into jail for up to three years. This section came before a bench of which Chalmeshwar, Justice Chalmeshwar and I were happened to sit. And in my judgment, I struck down this section on many grounds. We followed the clear and present danger test. We also said that these words are extremely vague and susceptible of misuse. We also said that anything may be grossly offensive to somebody and not to somebody else, may cause annoyance to somebody and not to somebody else. And merely being grossly offensive or annoying doesn't come within the eight pigeonholes in Article 19.2. But what was said in that case, so far as free speech is concerned, is the distinction between discussion, advocacy, and incitement. Now, we say it is open to anybody to discuss whatever he likes freely, howsoever loathsome it may be to his neighbor. Equally, he may advocate something which is loathsome to his neighbor. But it's only when it comes to actual incitement, where you actually incite a crowd, let's say in an election speech, to do something that you may curb free speech, and until that stage arises, you may not. The second important thing that we said was, the refined doctrine now of the chill factor, or the chilling effect on freedom of speech. And we define that to say, that if governmental authorities, or let's say a section like 66 capital A, were to catch hold of people and say you are liable to be sent to jail for let's say up to three years because you say something grossly offensive to somebody or you annoy somebody, then the chilling effect it will have on others will be such that unlike in near versus Minnesota, the few noxious branches will be removed and so will free speech itself. The baby and the bathwater will both be thrown out. Following on the heels of Shreya Singhal was another interesting judgment in 2017 in Justice Kajju's case. Justice Kajju is a retired judge of the Supreme Court. And he called Gandhiji a British agent and Subhash Chandra Bose a Japanese agent. And he is known for his outbursts. And Parliament censured him for this. So he filed an Article 32 petition. Now, 32 petition is 
a direct petition before the Supreme Court claiming that it is my fundamental right under Article 32 to claim the right to free speech under Article 19 1A. The Supreme Court dealt with what he said. In, importantly and interestingly said he had every right to say it. But that ultimately there was no cause of action because all that parliament did was to censure it. It didn't do anything further and therefore threw out the petition. I find that today India is at a crossroads. We have the major problem of there being no opposition worth the name. We also find that the print media and the television media does not criticize government the way it used to. These are facts that are known to all of us, may not be stated openly but they are facts. And in this milieu, we have recent incidents which are very disturbing. One incident is the incident of repeated hate speech being made against particular religious minorities. I have in another lecture dealt with this in detail, said as to how it interferes with our cardinal value of fraternity, which we have in the preamble. Because fraternity or brotherhood ultimately, as the preamble says, ensures the unity of the nation, apart from the dignity of every individual. It is also fleshed out now in our fundamental duties under Article 51, Capital A. And we are told under Fundamental Duty 51, Capital A, Subclause E, that it is every citizen's duty to ensure harmony and the spirit of common brotherhood that transcends religious barriers. We are also told by Fundamental Duty F that we have a composite culture, the word composite has to be underlined, which each of us must guide, must guard. And I had suggested that apart from the penal code which takes care of hate speech on the criminal side, citizens can now file suits in which not only do they claim injunctions against such hate speech, but punitive damages as well. So this is one major problem area when we come to freedom of speech in today's climate time. The other major area is an area where there are bans being imposed, followed by coercive action by the state. And I'm referring directly to the two BBC documentaries that have of late arrested our attention. The first documentary speaks of our present Prime Minister as Chief Minister of this state and what was done or not done in the Godra riot time. The second documentary speaks of our Prime Minister as leading the nation today and playing divisive politics is how the BBC puts it and refers to the CAA amendment, Citizenship Amendment Act refers to cow vigilantes murdering people, etc. Now, what was, what in fact followed after banning these two documentaries, and I might tell you that banning something is almost certain to make many more people see it than others see it. Because you are banning something which is on the internet, which in any case is Hydra edit. You may say banned under YouTube, banned under X, banned under Y, but another idea it will pop up and any one of these young gentlemen will immediately give you the BBC documentary on some other website. So it is a futile ban to start with. But the unfortunate thing is the ban itself. And what is even more unfortunate is the coercive action thereafter. In this case, it's the income tax rates on the BBC offices here. My dear friend Arun Jaitley, who is unfortunately no longer with us, if ever he stood for anything, he stood for freedom of speech because he suffered. He was in jail 
unlike most of these other gentlemen, for 19 months in the emergency. <laughs> and I might tell you that he was very proud of having appeared as a junior advocate to my father in the Express newspaper's case, which culminated in a judgment in 1985. Pretty much what is being done today was done then. The then Lieutenant Governor of Delhi, as soon as he became Lieutenant Governor in February 1980, got two notices issued to the Indian Express stating, number one, that the premises on which the building stood on Bahadur Shah Zafar Mark in New Delhi, the lease should be forfeited because there were certain breaches according to him. And of course, he got the Land and Development Office to do this. And second, that the building in any case by the second so-called notice should be demolished. Why? Because there was some platform which was beyond the floor area ratio, etc. Express newspapers went directly to the Supreme Court, claiming a 191A right. And government's answer was, your petition does not lie for the simple reason that it's a pure land problem. It has nothing to do with freedom of speech. Justice A.P. Sen, who wrote the majority judgment, in fact wrote the judgment on behalf of the court, said that this plea of the government left him cold. He then went on to say that he had no doubt whatsoever that this was a mala fide action. He characterized it as mala fide because in those days, 1985, you didn't have this doctrine of chill effect, which we have now. And he said it's a mala fide action. There's no doubt whatsoever that the right of 191A is being infringed and struck down the notices on this ground alone. Just as Venkatramaya, who joined, said these notices are arbitrary, struck them down under Article 14. And the third learned judge, Justice Mishra, agreed with both. Now, Mr. Jetli was very proud of this judgment, I must, I must tell you. And he used to speak about it often to me and often to many others. And would say that this is how a Supreme Court should behave when there is an all-powerful government who is trying to coerce one of the major newspapers of the day. And pretty much what is being done today is what was done then. Of course, the difference is that you use the LNDO there and today you are using the income tax. You are also using things like the ED. Now, you know, for example, the Enforcement Directorate are persons who slap a money laundering case on you. And because of a very unfortunate recent judgment of the Supreme Court undoing my earlier judgment, it becomes very difficult for persons to get bail in these cases. The ultimate conviction rate may be 0.2%. So there's no hope of your being convicted, but you will not be let out on bail. So if the coercive machinery of the state is to be used in this fashion, then there's no doubt that the chill effect or the chill factor spoken about in all our judgment comes into full play. I may be pardoned now for reading another fantastic passage, which is again quoted time out of number in our judgments, by Justice Brandis of the US Supreme Court in Whitney versus California. And pretty much everything that I have said so far is covered in this very beautiful passage. I might read it to you. He says in this case, those who won our independence believed that the final end of the state was to make men free to develop their faculties and that in its government, the deliberative forces should prevail over the arbitrary. They valued liberty both as an end and as a means. They believed liberty to be the secret of happiness and courage to be the secret of liberty. They believed that freedom to think as you will and to speak as you think are means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth. That without free speech and assembly, discussion would be futile. 
that with them discussion affords ordinarily adequate protection against the dissemination of noxious doctrine. Remember Near versus Minnesota. That the greatest menace to freedom is an inert people. That public discussion is a political duty. And that this should be a fundamental principle of the American government, substitute Indian government. They recognized the risks to which all human institutions are subject. But they knew that order cannot be secured merely through fear of punishment for its infraction. That it is hazardous to discourage, discourage thought, hope and imagination. That fear breeds repression that repression breeds hate, that hate menaces stable government, that the path of safety lies in the opportunity to discuss freely supposed grievances and proposed remedies, and that the fitting remedy for all evil counsels is good ones. Believing in the power of reason as applied through public discussion, they eschewed silence coerced by law the argument of force in its worst form. Recognizing the occasional tyrannies of governing majorities, they amended the constitution so that free speech and assembly should be guaranteed. Fear of serious injury cannot alone justify suppression of free speech and assembly. Men feared witches and burnt women. It is the function of speech to free men from the bondage of irrational fears. To justify suppression of free speech, there must be reasonable ground to fear that serious evil will result if free speech is practiced. There must be reasonable ground to believe that danger apprehended is, is imminent. There must be reasonable ground to believe that the evil to be prevented is a serious one. Those who won our independence by revolution were not cowards. They did not fear political change. They did not exalt order at the cost of liberty. To courageous, self-reliant men with confidence in the power of free and fearless reasoning applied through the processes of popular government, no danger flowing from speech can be deemed clear and present unless the incidence of the evil is apprehended and is so imminent that it may befall before there is opportunity for full discussion. If there be time to expose through discussion falsehoods and fallacies to avert the evil by the processes of education, the remedy to be applied is more speech, not enforced silence. Only an emergency can justify repression. Such must be the rule if authority is to be recorded with freedom. Beautiful words. I may be pardoned for just one more quote before ending, again by Justice Jackson. And this is from another celebrated judgment in American Communications versus Dowd, where he says that thought control is the copyright of totalitarianism. We have nothing to do with it. It is not the function of government to see that the citizen or prevent the citizen from falling into error. It is the function of the citizen to see that government does not fall into error. Beautiful put, beautiful put. I may only end by saying that ultimately every one of us as a citizen of India has a fundamental duty under Article 51, Capital A to abide by the Constitution and follow its noble ideals ideals are in the preamble, which I've already spoken about. The authorities equally have sworn an oath to the Constitution to uphold and defend it. And our Supreme Court, so far as freedom of speech is concerned, has spoken continuously and in one voice. And these are the four things that it has clearly laid down. First, that freedom of speech and expression is what we call a preferred freedom. Why is it preferred to other freedoms? Because it is crucial 
for the proper functioning of democracy. First. Second, if you are going to make curbs, you the government, those curbs have to be under very narrow and stringent limits. All the limits that there are in 192, which I have spoken about earlier. Third, that any ban of an uncertain duration is anathema to free speech. And for that the chill effect on free speech is something that is to be eschewed by all, most of all by the government. I would therefore call upon the government to live by the noble ideals of our constitution and this great fundamental right withdraw the present ban, withdraw the coercive action after the ban, see that no such bans are made in future, try and genuinely prevent free speech. Because unless this is done, we are a sovereign democratic republic in name only. Thank you all very much.